um, what a better way to start the year than with um, this very interesting conference on real food, agroecology, um, organic movements, regenerative agriculture, name it whatever uh, you prefer. It is our honor to be the opening session of the Oxford Real Farming Conference that is going virtual this year for the first time ever. My name is Charlotte Pavajo, and I'm pleased to be here with you today virtually from Geneva, Switzerland. I'm working for the BioVision Foundation. We are an NGO based in Switzerland, uh, focusing on ecological, organic, regenerative agriculture in East Africa and in Switzerland. Um, this event is co-organized by IFOAM Organic International, the global umbrella organization for organic farming, um, which supports uh, 1,000 members across all continents, representing organic and agroecological movement in their countries. As this is the first session of the conference, I would like to start with some very key housekeeping points so it's easier for you to get engaged with our session and with our speakers. Um, so you can contribute to our session in three ways. First, you can ask a question to the speakers using the ask a question button in the bottom middle of your screen. Uh, please, we really ask you to ask those questions through this channel rather than through the chat. Uh, you can also post a comment to the chat, uh, which you can find on the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, it should say, reads now, say something nice. And lastly, at the end of our 55 minutes, um, we'd be followed by a separate Zoom room for a more in-depth discussion with the speakers. Uh, a Zoom link will be shared with you through the chat at the end of the session, so you can connect to this separate uh, Zoom meeting for uh, further questions with our panelists. Now that we're done with the housekeeping, um, I would like to dive in our topic today uh, on policies that can support and in some cases that can enable sustainable agroecological organic regenerative farming to flourish and to take good care of our Mother Earth. Uh, so despite the myth, myth and misgivings about organic agriculture and agroecology and other truly sustainable and transformative approaches not being able to feed the world, we have evidence actually that with the right incentives in place, they actually can. And this requires the design and development of policies and a subsidy system that is now very much available um, in quite a few countries around the world. Um, they replace perverse measures such as subventions for fertilizers um, with, for example, investments in participatory research, in exploring sustainable techniques, or they can capacitate extension services to share all the all locally adapted solutions uh, that would certainly pay off. So governments are also beginning to recognize the urgent need to transform our food systems. This has been made even more pressing with the current health and economic crisis caused by the COVID pandemic. And currently they are good, but rather scattered example of governments around the world that have been developing conducive and innovative policies uh, and are introducing and implementing agroecological and resilient principles. So today I would like to invite you to a journey covering three continents uh, and ask you to join three leading policymakers from India, Denmark and Uganda as they explain the good policy practices they are helping to put in place which make possible the long-term transformation of food and agricultural system of their countries. We, have, we will have uh, three presentations, 15 minutes each, uh, with two or three um, short clarification questions afterward. And then we will move to a Q&A session uh, for about 20 minutes. As you will see, some of the presentations are quite heavy on the content, and you'll probably have a lot of questions to able to understand how these policies work among their very different conditions. Um, so therefore, I really encourage you to join us for the, for the discussion afterwards 
um, on a separate uh, Zoom meeting. So let us start our journey in India. Our first speaker, uh, Professor Rajeshwa Singh Channel, the executive director of the state project implementing unit at the government of Himachal Pradesh, India. Dr. Chandel has successfully led an initiative to bring about 80,000 farmers under the ambit of natural farming across all 12 district, districts of Himachal Pradesh. He envisions a long-term system to cater all of the 900,000 farmers across the state and connect them with consumers. Professor Shandol, can you share with us details of your progressive program and your plan to engage such a huge number of farmers that would turn the food system of the whole state into a truly sustainable one? Uh, thank you, Shalek. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and at the very ups uh, onset of this program, I wish to thank the organizers of ORFC Global 2021. Specifically, I uh, wish to make the mention of uh, Mr. Gabor, who just gave me the chance, who just first conveyed us to be the part of this very important conference. So thank you so much. So now I wish to present how the Himachal Pradesh, one of the mountainous state in the, this Himalayan region, is working towards this agroecological practices. So I wish to share my uh, presentation. So our Yeah, uh, so I'll speak on this sustainable food system platform for natural farming. This is in brief SUSPNF, how we are working on it. So just to move ahead, we have a very strong system of the farmers. We have now over 95,000 farmers who have been converted to agroecological system uh, based basically on the Palekar theory of natural farming. So here we have the four pillars that is Jivamrit, Achadan, Vaps and Vijamrit. And in short, you can see how this culture of fertility creating microorganism, this is Jivamrit. Achadan is soil covered with lime mulch and crop residues. And then Vapsa, this is soil aeration mixed with water vapors. And another is Bijamrit. This is seed treatment by microculture. These are the four pillars of this natural farming system. So how we are just mapping the 10 principle of the agroecology, which is given by the FAO. So here you can see by G application of the Jivamrit, we are working on to enhance the efficiency. We are working to recycle. We are working to uh, then through Achadan here again, we are mapping the recycling. We are uh, we are focusing on synergies. We are focusing on the resilience. We are enhancing the uh, resilience of the cropping system in Himachal Pradesh. And by the application of this BAPSA, one of the most important pillars of this natural farming, we are mapping again this efficiency, recycling. And so there are so many overlaps. So here initially, because we have now established the production system. The farmers are successfully growing different crops, whether vegetables or fruits or the traditional crops, successfully based on the natural farming without the chemicals. And here you can see here that we are mapping these principles, five principles through the production system. Now our next focus would be to work on these another five principles through the creation of the sustainable food system platform for natural farming. Here, now you can see this PK3, this is Prakriti Kheti Khushal Kisan Yojana. This is the natural farming prosperous farmers program of the government of Himachal Pradesh. And through this program, we have a strong production base. As I have already explained, we have over 95,000 farmers who have converted partially or fully to the natural farming practices. Now, we have the big data analytics. Now there is a one more scheme, Bharatiya Prakriti Krishi Padati. What is the traditional 
farming systems of the India. This scheme has been given by the government of India. We are collaborating with this scheme and now we are focusing on the SDGs also. We are mapping seven SDGs through this PK3 Yojana that is Prakriti Kheti Khushal Kisan Yojana. But now our next focus is SUSPNF that is Sustainable Food System for Natural Farming. Through this sustainable food system, now we are focusing to create a supply value chain that is we are connecting the producers with the consumers based on the principles of the transparency and the traceability that is from the market there could be the clear cut traceability the where from his produce the uh, produce of the consumer is coming and what is the final true value true costing which the farmer is getting from the market so these, these, this is our new focus of working. Here, just you look at the current stat. We have covered all 12 districts, 80 development blocks, and we are working. We have uh, spread our work in 91 panchayats. Panchayat is a group of around 20 to 30 villages. So this is the smallest unit uh, in the rural area. So we have covered around 91%. We have over 1 lakh trained farmers. Through these trainings, we have converted now more than one lakh farmers as of now and covered 50 uh, uh, more than 5000 hectare area to the natural farming practices here now you see the local produce although the area is very less but you must here fo focus on small holders because our average land holding is less than one acre and himachal pradesh is such a mountainous state where more than 87 percent of the farmers are small so our focus is the small holders. So uh, gradually we are focusing on, on to announce the area also. But here you see how with the local markets, our farmers, the surplus is coming to the producers. But still our focus is to make this unorganized market into the convert to the organized markets. So what, what are the strategies to create this uh, platform? So we are now in the process of creating this farmer interested groups or uh, uh, per villages and then these villages will be clustered through FPOs. This is farmer producer organization. So now we are in the process of creating, we have created some farmer producer organizations. These farmer producer organizations will work on some clusters and at state level we will have a consortium of the FPOs which will finally work on the brand which will finally work to create the online uh, e-commerce uh, markets then this 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 body will be responsible to uh, uh, to, to just uh, uh, relay back the techn technological interventions to these clusters and finally to create franchises youth and entrepreneurs at the lowest levels here uh, we have some challenges uh, because earlier we have seen that in India, uh, uh, around 20% uh, percent of the FPCs, uh, this is farmer producer companies. So these farmer producer companies, they have some challenges, that is capital challenges, they are capability challenges, they are compliance, is coordination. But in Himachal, we have right now 22 farmer producer organizations. And they are working in the different topographical infrastructure situations. Uh, but they have underdeveloped value chains and logistics. So our now focus is to, because we will have create a large natural farmer uh, base of nine lakh farmers in the in the in the in the, in the uh, years to come. Here we have a strong history of working together. So we will create the niche based farmer groups. We'll provide them the technology. We'll connect them with the producers based on the transparency and traceabilities here what would be the final prototype so initially now we are working on creating a prototype at one district by based on the four, we have in himachal pradesh four agroclimatic zones so how the 360 base, uh, 65 days market can be created so we have the shivalik hills mid hills cold dry zone and high hills so now how this produce of the natural farmers will be collated in one city and then their one prototype mark prototype this outlet will be initiated very soon so we have a short term methodology 
we have a uh, long term methodology how from the one uh, collective uh, considering the two district how will collect this produce how will uh, uh, will 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 take it back to the uh, to, to one outlet and then successful model of one outlet will be then roll out to the rest of the state so if we come to the big picture presently we have a strong production base now our next focus is to create the farmer producer organizations and the organized markets so through creation of it platform and mapping the sdgs and finally the policy decisions at the government level will enable us to bring this production base finally through transparency and traceability to the consumers through these various processes so here the consumers and the entrepreneurs they will be directly connected with the producer producers through e-commerce through e-cloud through internet of things through business intelligence models and through sdgs so we have created one system of the farmer certification system we have given the three star rating to the best farmer two star then one star the one star who will be just entering into the natural farming system although he is working on a partial piece of land he is converting converted partially he will get the one star the second star is the farmer who is working on the partial piece piece of land but completely on natural principles and third star the whole of the land is converted and the whole principle of the natural farming the farmer is applying so these we have given certain values to the farmers practices and those values will be uploaded on the, on the on the computer system and computer system will finally decide the rating of the farmer and the farmer the best farmer with three star he will get the direct benefits from the state governments through various procedures here we, we have a slide you can see after the presentation how our farmers they have the diversity they have the different crops how he is gaining in the yield how is getting good quality how is getting better shelf life so this slide particularly will explain the real situation of the himachal farmer how he look at the agroecology here we have some successful model in india this uh, mds uh, 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 amma kitchen is there kudum shri kitchen is there didi kitchen is there so these are the successful model we are incorporating in our plan to implement in himachal pradesh while we are planning for the creation of the uh, outlets based on the transparency and transfer uh, transparency and traceability uh, while connecting the farmers with the consumers yes it's not only the farmer the connection of the the, the connectivity of the farm producer with the consumer we are considering the indices we are working on the uh, hlps uh, p46 uh, this announcements we are looking as, as, at the sdgs we are also focusing specifically on the un ccds where our own prime minister has, has declared that by 2000 30 we will reduce the 30 percent of the uh, degree land uh, degradation status here we have some strengths with us we are working on the 1 2 6 8 9 12 and 15 sdgs we have the agro biodiversity on our farms we are working to protect the himalayan uh, ecosystem which is very fragile and we are working on land restoration, soil health, and socio-economic well-being of the mountainous people through this natural farming. Uh, I have already explained about it. How we are meeting the mapping the SDGs also. Here, the biggest strength with the us is the a, a, the international best practices, a booklet which is recently released by the FAO and the INRA. So this book has the best international practices around the globe. It has considered around 20 countries from different uh, continents. And it has also referred Himachal Pradesh as one of the success story. So we have 
360 degree view of food system through this book so we are considering this book as the basic <laughs> principle to implement the sustainable food system in himachal pradesh here we have the farmer now we have the market now we have the community now we have the the most important strength with us is the commitment of the state government the state government is all, all out it it has give, uh, this is the one of the flagship program of this government to implement the this natural farming and to convert the whole of the himachal pradesh into this natural farming state by 2022 so thank you very much uh, i have tried to uh, conclude my presentation within your uh, within the given period so i would welcome the questions uh, from the audience thank you very much if if there is something from issue then then uh, you can also write on the email also uh, yes if i look at this uh, chat screen the question says are there any opportunities for people to come over to india and work closely with the farmers using your system to learn from them to diversify their own practices in their homeland yes it's question from look at neck yes look at neck i would be very happy because himachal pradesh has my state has become the home to the people from other states also they are coming here they are requesting us they are staying with our farmers they are residing with our farmers and they are looking how these agroecological principles are applying on the farm while the farmers are converting their land so we would welcome you uh another question is uh uh huh? i i just wanted to thank you very much professor shandal for these very interesting insights and um i hope himachal pradesh will be remembered as one of the few forerunners to show us that a transformation towards truly sustainable food system is possible Um, yeah. And I think you really nicely demonstrated that uh, a thoughtful leadership um, uh, is very important to to maintain those success. Um, as as you just yourself um, explain, and, and one of the question was on on the uh, the need for um, learning across countries of uh, exchange of experience, not only between farmers but maybe also between policymakers, between researchers, between actors of um, different part of the world that have developed a solution and that could. Um, uh, demonstrate that options are are possible to to others um i'm i'm just going to very quickly mention a second question and then i would propose to keep the other questions for our discussion session um uh, in the second part of this event um is, is it I, i sorry 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 shall i answer this second question uh if you wish you can provide a, a short answer now yes, yes. we can also like come back to it a, a bit later as well uh, the question says that do you think that placing such importance on it system is a good move considering the distance it creates between producer and consumers compared to a real market situation i find that people are disconnected from their food production because of online shops and large supermarkets yes this is our priority this is our priority and within very short period of time we will convert transform this system online system because transparency and traceability will all be relooked relayed only on the base of base of the development of the it system so it system is our priority thank you very much again professor shandal and, and uh, we see you again in, in during the second part of this event Um so now our next speaker is uh, Mr Alex Wakuba commissioner for the crop production department in the Ministry of Agriculture Animal Industry and Fisheries in Uganda um involved both in organic research and civil society leadership he is today the official um focal officer for organic agriculture issues within the Ministry of Agriculture 
He significantly contributed to the development of the country's recently adopted national organic agricultural policy. Uh, and I think he strongly believes that with one of the lowest inorganic fertilizer application in the world, most of Ugandan farmers, particularly small holders, could easily convert to organic agriculture if adequately trained and uh, if access to input is provided. Um, so, Mr. Wakuba, could you tell us today how Uganda made it um, to have such a progressive and comprehensive policy and what could maybe um, other countries or other African countries learn from your experience? Mr. Lakuba, I, I think we have a little uh, um, technical sound problem. Can you uh, maybe activate your microphone? We, we should hear you uh, very, very soon. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry, we, we still cannot hear you. Uh, let's give it another try. Um, it seems we, we have a little technical problem with uh, Mr. Lwakuba. Um, maybe um, in the meantime that you can um, fix this technical problem, I, I would maybe propose to, to move to our third speaker and come back to you, uh, Mr. Lwakuba, when, when you manage to, to resolve um, this little technical problem. I'm sorry, this is... Um, um, not avoidable, I guess, in, in any of those labels. Um, so now I would like to move back to Europe and more specifically to Denmark. Uh, our speaker is Mr. Paul Holmbeck, who was a director of Organic Denmark for eight years. Organic Denmark became one of the world's leading NGO in the organic food sector and one that played a key role in making Denmark the country with the highest annual per capita spending on organic food in the EU. And through the formulation and an overarching policy framework with the right incentives for organic. So Paul has a very long and successful track record in professional lobby and organic action plans, policy formulation, and is now directing Hombeck Eco Consult, advising leaders in government, business and NGOs around the world. So Paul, can you tell us how we should go about designing policies that support organic and agroecology when it comes to a European environment um, and such a powerful policy framework as a, the common agricultural policy um, that applies to the European Union? Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, I, um, I hope we can get back to Alex because I know it's a very interesting presentation. Um, greetings from Denmark. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen now. Um, I hope everyone can see that. Um, I'm going to share some lessons from Denmark. I hope they're useful for you uh, for how organic policy and uh, NGO mobilization, the organic movement, uh, have been drivers for developing organic farming and for market breakthroughs. Um, today, I'll start with some results from organic policy and then some lessons from policy development and implementation, both the what, it's uh, some examples, of organic policies in Denmark, but also the how, the alliances, the lobby efforts, the broad involvement in policy process. And throughout this, I'll have focus on building a transformative uh, alliance and uh, an infrastructure. And for policymakers out there, I want to put special focus on the key role of organic NGOs as partners for government in policymaking and as change agents, tools for government out in the market and, uh, and in the fields. 
Um, Denmark is a world leader in organic sales with uh, 12% of the total food market. That's two to four times uh, as much as uh, in the United States, for example, and in the larger countries of Europe. Um, the potential is much greater. Uh, our organic logo is known by 99% of, uh, of all Danes and 80% of Danes are buying organic food and more than 50% are buying organic food every week. Uh, a great number of normal everyday products um, from milk to eggs to many vegetables, oils, etc. We have 30 to 50% of the total food market today. Uh, a number of other areas, we have lower market shares, they're still rising, but for beef and pork and cheese, for example, um, where organic consumers are really the leaders in a more plant-rich diet, um, but where we still have increases. So organics is, um, during COVID also has, where we've had increases in the total food market of 7%, the organic market was double that, 14%. Um, so organics is not just a niche in Denmark anymore. It's getting to be the new normal and it's really the future of food. Some issues, some products like bananas, for example, are now being totally taken off the shelves in the conventional form where they're only gonna be selling organic in the future. Um, exports have increased 12 fold, uh, only with one year where we went down a little because we had so much, uh, so many sales on the home market. Food service, which I'll come back to, the development has been dramatic, uh, also a five-fold increase since 2010. And there's been growth and innovation on the farms, also driven by policy and by um, the organic NGO. The organic area has doubled since 2007 to also about 11%, 12%. 25% of the eggs, 40% of vegetables produced are organic. Organic farmers are also earning more than conventional farmers. Um, and we have a centrally coordinated research effort that is also without walls. In other words, it's integrated in all the universities in the country. And organics is leading innovation, developing new solutions for carbon drawdown, for soil fertility, animal welfare, to such a degree that the chairman for all farmers and all food companies in Denmark said the organic sector, creates new solutions and inspires all of agriculture. Another reason to support organics. And none of this happened on its own. Uh, it's been a close collaboration between the organic farmers and companies and their association, the Organic Denmark, and policymakers and the retail sector have been driving this development. So an active organic policy driving market growth, innovation, conversion of farms, the new government has just uh, adopted a double a goal for doubling the organic area again, um, doubling market, uh, the Danish market and exports in 2030. And research also shows that it's the organic NGO as a catalyst for organic success, which is very different in Denmark. It's driving collaboration partnerships that mobilize business and policy and consumers. So the what of policy, just some examples. Um, we've had a balanced mix of push and pull measures. So push from production and pull from the market. Um, we've had conversion checks, it's advice, I'll come back to this, on the farm, education, demonstration of best farm practice, conversion payments, which are relatively low in Denmark compared to many other countries, but they are important. And then farm innovation and research, but also grassroots research. Um, the Danish word for, for science is vinskab. It means uh, knowledge creation. And much of the knowledge being created is really out on the organic farm. So this has been supported with mini grants to support trying out all kinds of new ideas. And then NGO capacity build, building for the advisory system and for innovation activities. On the market side, NGO capacity building has been extremely important for actually for all of the market activities from collaboration with retail, strengthening skills and companies, public procurement agreements where we've had a mobile team helping the municipalities write tenders that promote organic, uh, product innovation, export promotion, and then also consumer awareness around our logo. Um, just a couple of examples. One really effective tool has been these conversion checks where a farmer gets 
advice about uh, conversion to organic farming and a picture of how their farm would look as an organic farm. Um, and this has proven to be hugely motivating, even for very skeptical farmers. Um, to such a degree that we've had partnerships now with 29 municipalities where we go into areas and offer these organic conversion checks to all of the farmers in the areas where they want to protect nature and where they want to uh, protect water resources. Um, another tool which we can actually thank our Ugandan uh, colleagues for is uh, barn and field schools um, where groups of farmers rotate among farms addressing specific challenges together could be animal health, soil fertility. And this is something that Organic Denmark worked with our uh, partner organizations in Uganda with for many years. Um, it was working well there. We brought it back to Denmark um, and these farm family learning groups became our barn and field schools, proving very effective. Then in order to promote value chain collaboration, we had a mobile product development team. So having a uh, product development expert working as here together with a farmer, a buyer from retail and a mill owner to develop high quality new products based on uh, older corn varieties um, on this little island, uh, which has converted 100% to organic. Um, one of the examples of the role of the NGO as a policy tool that's most interesting, I think, is Organic Denmark's role in driving growth in the retail sector. So as a representative of the producers, Organic Denmark goes in and works with top leadership in retail on organic strategy. And then working down has made now partnerships with all retail actors in Denmark. Um, and then has worked with them on helping them to expand their product assortment, present products better in the store, and communicate a lot better with consumers. And the result of this is, is, a, is a dynamic upward going spiral on sales. And so, and it's, it's bringing organics out to uh, the people uh, outside, but also in the stores, making it very visible and available. And also there's been political support for bringing people out to organics um, where we have our harvest markets, which is a marketing for the farmers who are selling directly to uh, consumers. And now we have four times as many organic farmers that are either earning a living or supplementing their income by selling directly to consumers. Uh, and then we have our organic day as here where uh, people can come out and see the cows uh, stampede out onto the fresh green grass uh, after a long winter. And we have 250,000 Danes out there every year. Now that may not sound like much, but it's a fairly small country. So this would be, this is about you know, about 5% of the population between harvest markets and this event are out on organic farms every year. That'd be in the UK, that'd be like 3 million people uh, out on an organic farm on a, on a given day. Um, we also do export initiatives, partly supported by government, partly supported by, of course, the food companies with 20 or 40 or 50 companies working together. Um, and then I want to just describe a, all these push and pull strategies, what does this mean meant for something like carrots, um, where our organic sector strategies actually become food policy? Um, and so working at each level, we have, you know, at the farm level, advice and training, research and development, conversion funding. The companies are being helped with market information so they can work better in the market, but also developing new products, working with new crop varieties and then doing working in all sales uh, possibilities all the way out to the customers tasting new carrots. And the result of this is that we have half of the market now, the total food market for carrots. So organic policy works and can drive this kind of development. And the important thing here is the why at the behind all this policy support from 10 out of 11 political parties in our parliament uh, is that, uh, or the why of organic, it's because organics deliver on, stu on uh, sustainable development goals. And we approach uh, politicians where they are. And for some politicians, they support organic because of green growth, job creation. And for others, it's uh, environment and others, it's animal welfare or creating new opportunities for farmers. 
Um, but this together, this means that there's a need for an aggressive development of organic uh, food policy. And our approach to the whole uh, organizational ecosystem is very much the same. So we have close collaboration with organizations working with environment, climate, animal welfare, the farmers, and also the trade unions representing the people working on farm, in factories, and also in the public kitchens, working in solidarity with them on improving uh, their work and their competitiveness and competencies. So the last thing is the how of policy, um, some key elements in success. I've mentioned the balance push-pull and capacity building in organic NGOs as a kind of a motor for change in the market and in the fields. Another has been a broad platform for involvement. Very early on, we established an organic food and agricultural council, which was deeply rooted in the organic movement, farmers, food companies, but also had environmental and consumer interests, uh, conventional farm interests, a variety of ministries represented. So it was a, a base for development of policy. Um, two key things in terms of state policy capacity is high level ministry uh, placement. So the organic uh, work is placed high up in the system and then also having a dedicated organic unit learning constantly and working on how to develop organics. Another unique feature as I experienced from uh, working in many other countries is the degree to which we've embedded organic policy as a tool in other broader green growth policies. So every time there's been a policy for biodiversity, for clean water, for developing farming, for green growth, for green exports, we've incorporated organics as a positive tool that can help the country reach its goals. And a big challenge now is creating true game changers that level the playing field in the market with lower sales taxes on organic products, for example, or higher green fees so that the environmental costs for conventional farming is reflected. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just have um, a few seconds to conclude. I will. Your speech. Super. We're running out of time. Great. So we've used these organic action plans actively. And the last example I want to give is the political support and NGO mobilization for 60% organic in the public kitchens. This is a good example of how policy and mobilization in the sector work together. On the policy side, a national goal, creating focus and energy um, around the 60% goal. Uh, Copenhagen is already 90%. Many cities have met this goal. Uh, financing support for cities for education, and then an organic cuisine label, which creates both documentation, but also a lot of pride when kitchens have reached 30, 60, and 90% organic. And then the sector side, guarantee for supply, organizing farmers and food companies to ensure the products are there when the public sector seeks them. We did organic schools for the food service companies, brought them out on farms, etc., and then did the education out in the kitchens. And what we end up with as a result is not just shifting to organic, but a sustainable organic agenda with less meat, more greens and root veggies, food in season, reduced waste. So healthy, organic, climate-friendly meals within the same budget. And understandably, there is a lot of pride about that. And so it's celebrated with huge banners celebrating the people who made Copenhagen and organic capital. And that's what we really need to remember is that transition is about empowering people to use their craft and work together to actually drive uh, a green transition. So thank you very much. I hope some of that was useful for you. Uh, you can find more information uh, on these home pages and also with the Food Policy Forum for Change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, it was very inspiring also to hear the example of Denmark uh, as another worldwide pioneer in supporting uh, sustainable farming and in designing policy that um, are inclusive, participatory, and, and also like quite holistic. Um, so the, the Danish approach is, is um, kind of a modern and innovating, innovative um, pathway um, that managed to create political, uh, cultural, uh, enabling environment uh, for a new model of sustainability. Um, so I propose we, we're going to um, take all the questions that are addressed to you uh, later in, during our panel discussion and to move back now to 
uh, Mr. Alex Mukamba. Uh, we would like to welcome Alex again. Um, we are lo looking forward to hearing from him. Um, again, Alex, Commissioner for the Crop Production Department at the Ministry of Agriculture in Uganda. Alex, I hope we can hear you well this time. Um, I think we are still um, encountering a few technical issues. Can, can you really be sure that your mic is on mute at, at the bottom left of your screen? Please check that the unmute button is activated. Alex, are you with us today? Um, we, we could hear you well earlier. Uh, so this is really a shame, but I'm, I'm sure you can manage to, to fix that very quickly. I, I have done that. Yes, we can hear you. I have done that. I have the, done the, that. It is unmute. <laughs> So I'm muted. Can, can you, you hear me now? We can. The floor is yours. So uh, please, you you have maybe um, yes, 10, 12 minutes to, to mm -hmm. present your examples from Uganda. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm trying my level best. Hmm. Hear me now? Can I roll now on the screen? Okay. Like 10 minutes now left on the, the panelists, and thank you very much, and Professor. Now, in the market, Uganda is going to convert more and more area into organic. Um, and if the policy is conducive, now that we have the policy, um, yes, we are going, and uh, if we have the also additional uh, awareness, uh, we should be having more organic uh, um, actors in Uganda and uh, increase even the, uh, the the volume of exports. Uh, uh, can you hear me? It is slow, unfortunately, my rolling. It's slow, the sharing. It's slow, I cannot run pretty fast. I think it is internet connection. Oh. Um, otherwise, uh, maybe what uh, um, uh, prompted us to write a policy is because of uh, uh, the global market uh, uh, demand and uh, because of uh, the consumer shifts, uh, the preferences for safe and uh, uh, for safe food, uh, food which is uh, free from uh, uh, hazards associated with uh, the band. Uh, chemicals and inorganic chemicals. That is what prompted us to um, uh, write the organic agriculture policy. But also we have opportunities in Uganda. For example, uh, uh, we still have um, uh, about 210,000 uh, 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 210, farmers who are certified organic and yet the number can increase and uh, the area uh, under production is only 262, uh, 262,282. Uh, so the area is still small and the potential is still is high. So you, the opportunities are in Uganda and uh, the, uh, most of the farmers uh, produce almost organically, uh, albeit uh, the lack of certification and the standards. And uh, the other opportunity that we have that uh, maybe invoked writing of this policy to support uh, the organic agriculture subsector uh, is that uh, we have a quota free. We have a limitless uh, 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 volume of uh, produce that has to penetrate uh, the European market and the American market. So the demand is high and Uganda has an opportunity to produce and uh, sell more organic uh, food to uh, the rest of the world. However, the problem, the, uh, uh, the problem that uh, we tend to address uh, in this policy is that of low production and low productivity. And uh, uh, the organic agriculture producers are mainly small-scale farmers 
and uh, we need to actually address their plight and uh, the capacity to meet certification and standards. These are but uh, the problems uh, that uh, the policy is trying to address. And also low investments in organic agriculture inputs, ma ma uh, input uh, manufacturing and uh, inadequate awareness because the policy, the organic agriculture promotion has largely been driven by the private sector. And so it is not in the mainstream uh, public uh, uh, extension delivery systems and uh, also the research. So this and uh, the poor coordination and also a, a, a well articulated policy and regulation is what invoked the policy uh, crafting. Now, we, we, we started writing this policy way back in 2004, and uh, it has taken us uh, 16 years uh, to complete this policy. It was uh, um, approved on uh, the 29th of July 2019, and uh, it was uh, launched on the 29th of November, uh, 29th of September uh, 2020. And now we have started um, a wide scale regional uh, dissemination of the policy. We have done one regional uh, policy dissemination in Western Uganda, and next week we are going to do one in Northern Uganda. Now we are moving to uh, uh, disseminations. The policy targets all levels of leadership, political leadership, and mainly targets Minister of Agriculture and Wilderness and Fisheries and other ministries, departments, and agencies like Minister of Trade, um, uh, uh, Minister of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, mainly the National Bureau of Standards. It also uh, targets research institutions. It targets uh, the commodity agencies like coffee, like cotton, and also private sector such as the Nas uh, National Organic Agriculture Movement of Uganda and uh, civil society organizations. This policy goal is mainly to uh, harness the country's organic agriculture potential by ensuring a regulated subsector that contributes to national development. And uh, we see we have a vision. Uh, the vision is a sustainable and profitable organic agriculture subsector uh, for national competitiveness. And the policy is well aligned to national uh, and macroeconomic uh, policy, uh, macroeconomic uh, development policy frameworks and uh, development aspirations. Um, the policy objectives uh, mainly uh, revolve around agricultural research and appropriate technology, uh, production, processing, and marketing of organic products, and uh, appropriate post harvest handling, and uh, standard certification and accreditation, and then strengthening environmental conservation indigenous biodiversity and sustainable use of the natural resources. The policy areas are seven. Uh, one is to enhance research, technology development and dissemination. Um, and the second policy area is uh, promoting organic agriculture education and training. And the third is enhancing organic agricultural production and technology support. And the fourth is post harvest handling, storage and value addition. Uh, the fifth is uh, addressing standards, certification, and accreditation. And the sixth is uh, market development and promotion. And the last two one is uh, sustainable use of natural resources and the conservation of indigenous knowledge. We have also cross-cutting issues to do with uh, 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 gender, equity, use, participation, climate change. And uh, those are the areas. Uh, the implementation arrangement is that the policy is hosted by Minister of Agriculture and Monitors and Fisheries and mainly the Director of Crop Resources and they're specifically uh, the department that are head of crop production. And uh, uh, Mr. the financing is premised on uh, grants or allocation is uh, appropriation is from government and grants from development partners, from uh, private sector, from civil society, from community support and uh, household savings and individual contributions. And the lesson is that we learned is uh, it took long to formulate this. I've uh, talked to that. And uh, basically, because of lack of committed or dedicated funding, and uh, somehow apparent support from uh, uh, the 
Um, it seems uh, we lost Alex for just a little while. Um, I would like to invite all our participants to join the second part of the event. Uh, you're going to see a, a link for a, a Zoom meeting appearing in the chat section. Uh, please join us uh, with our three panelists from India, Denmark and Uganda. Uh, where we're going to explore some of the questions that uh, were raised in, in, during the chat session, um, where also you would have the opportunity to ask more questions and maybe um, uh, tackle some of the issues that are close to your heart um, linked to, to the experience of Uganda, India and Denmark. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the Zoom session. Uh, please follow the link that is shared with you through the chat box. Um, and um, for those that um, would not be able to attend this second part, I thank you very much for joining us for uh, the first session of the Oxford Real Farming Conference uh, on Agroecological Policies. Um, I wish you a very good day and please um, join us for the second part of this event through the, the Zoom link.